So, uh, remember the CD uh, for the assessment. On the next exams, uh, I want us to take a picture to upload it. So, uh, be prepared for that. Let me know if you have any problems. Today, we're going to start talking about applications of derivatives. Like, this is a big theme in this. There's a, there's a number of big uh, sort of pieces of this chapter. One of them is curve sketching, and one of them is optimization, right? And optimization is one of the big tools for calculus. This is uh, one of the things that makes calculus useful. Um, but let's begin with uh, the notion of, we'll talk about 401 and maybe a bit into 402 today. Okay, let me just start off with the definition here. And then just going to talk about what this means. Let F be defined. On the domain D. So just think of D as some set of real numbers. Um, if um, L of C is greater than or equal to F of X, we'll call it X. Then, uh, the number f of c, so here's what we're saying f is a function, and the block coordinate at point c, the block coordinate at c is bigger than every other, bigger than or equal to every other uh, y coordinate. And f of c is. Um, Absolute maximum uh, and that's on if F of C is less than or equal to F of X or all. And F of C is the absolute number. So that's collectively. Um, Absolute max min values for two pairs. So sometimes we might say uh, uh, absolute extreme values, things like this. Okay, so let me let me give you some examples. Lots of different Can anybody think of a function that has an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum? Any example whatsoever? I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good example. Uh, uh, and I really like this example for the following reason. Um, uh, This function. Does that have an absolute maximum, absolute minimum, both, neither? Right. This is the old friendly parabola, right?
the y coordinate is zero right here, and it's uh, never less than right? So notice that the y value here is less than or equal to all of the y values. Okay, can somebody uh, can somebody think of a function that has no absolute extreme? I know what you actually though it's sort of the opposite, but I understand why you say why it was two. This one's really kind of shaky. Does this have an absolute maximum? Does it have an absolute minimum? In fact, this is how stupid this function is. Every point is both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. Everything is. And it's because it's less than 40. So every point on this horizontal line is an absolute maximum and absolute minimum. Now, can you change this example a little bit so that there's no absolute maximum? There you go. Just, just bend this a little bit. If you have something like this, no. And this one is every. On the green one, every point is both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. On, on the red, there's no limit to how low you can go or how high. So there's no. How about this? See what I did. I put my foot in the parabola and jerked up that point. How about that one? That's exactly right. It doesn't have any, right? Because everybody agreed that the white coordinate gets as big as you want. So there's, there's no biggest value. Why is there no smallest value? Right. Notice that this function can never be negative, right? And this function also can't be zero, right? But, but no matter how small you are close to zero, there's half of that is there, right? So for example, if you've got the y value of one tenth there somewhere, so you now you've got the y value of 120 and one over a hundred, you've also got one over two hundred. So this has got no max. No man. Uh, how about anybody think of an example of a function that has infinitely many maxes and mins, but is not a horizontal line? What's that mean? Oh, great. Uh, that's a great example. For this one, we have absolute max D. one, because that's the biggest sign in the middle. The absolute min negative one, and these both occur infinitely often. So do y'all feel like you've got kind of a picture of what maxes and mins are? Now, okay, I want to look at the, somebody remind me what it means for function. In intuition, I, I don't need the delta x. Okay, no jump. So here's the way I like to think of it. This is mathematically uh, quite precise. And so, 
but I'm going to lie to too much. I never really said to, but intuitively, you said for a lot of functions, continuous means you can draw them up big enough. Okay, so what does it mean for an interval to be closed? That's right. A closed interval is just like you all know what an interval is, right? It's just everything that gives you numbers. Closed means it's got the endpoints as well. Okay, so let me do a couple of things. Here is a function on an open interval. Actually, Would everybody agree that this function is continuous on the open interval? Does it have a maximum? No, or a minimum. Okay, so this is a this is function is continuous open interval. No max. No Now, let me point out that you certainly could have a max. What if we have this? The red one is a continuous function, and it does have a max, but the blue one doesn't. Um, here's a function on a closed interval. By the way, the blue one, does that look familiar? Does anybody uh, know a, a concrete function that you may have encountered in your studies before that looks kind of like blue? Excellent. Right, this looks like that tangent, right? And there's some other ones. So, um, how about this? What if we have a closed interval here? Uh, now I've got both intervals, or I'm sorry, both endpoints. This is a function on closed memory, right? It's like a line, but I move this point up here. I move This function is on a closed interval. Does it have a maximum? This does not have a maximum, right? Because where is it? No matter what point you pick up here, you can go just a little bit higher. If I agree with that, that drop down kills it. Does it have a minimum? There's no minimum, right? Because no matter how low you go, you go a little bit low. By the way, can you change this function a little bit so it does have? Well, like, can you change it so it's got a minimum and no max? How could you do that? Yeah. 
That's right. So I can do this. What she said is move the dot down here, right? Or I can even go lower. I want it. Now, would everybody agree this has a min with no max? Yes. It's just not completely from the line. Ah, this is clearly the man because this is the absolute lowest block coordinate that this red function ever has, right? Are you okay with that? So you're, so you're saying, I get it when you say absolutely the minimum, which is why I don't know what you're saying. But why couldn't that side, why couldn't it be a you're not claiming it's absolute. Well, uh, well, when I say men, I mean absolute. Men. That's, that's what I mean. And I'm going to talk about the difference. And I'm going to talk about the local men. Well, that's not. But where are you guys okay with this? The white quarter here is as low as it goes. Yes. Sir. So uh, if, the, if the other dot was above the function, it would have a match, right? That's right. If it was here or higher, it would have a max. Absolutely. Wait, okay. This doesn't have a min or a max, the blue one, because I can just sort of row and row and row down here and row and row here because I don't have the end. Of it. This one. I seem to have got no max and minus because I cheated, right? I broke the function, right? I pulled the end. Now, what if you have a closed interval like this, but I make one more required? I want to have a continuous function on a closed interval. So it doesn't matter really where I put my dots here. Here. And here. Now I've got to connect these two dots somehow. So it's, it's almost the same as starting here, except I've got a new rule. I have to connect from this dot to this dot by drawing something red mark without lifting it up. I can't do that here, right? I can't make this change, right? Because to do this, I have to jump. Agree? Now, my claim is if I connect these two without picking up, connect these two without this, it has to have both maps. Now, uh, notice if I go up always from here, this will be a min, right? So I'm going to try to avoid this to make a man going down. So now it's not a mini, but up, up, this is going to be a man. So now I've got to go lower. Up, now this is going to be a man, so I've got to go lower. Oh, crap, I've got to get back here at some point. <laughs> this thing has both a maximum and a minimum value. Right? Um, where's the maximum? All the way over here. Now the minimum isn't here because I went down. Where is it? It's right where all the walls. Minimum actually happened. And even if I didn't go straight back to max, if I come around, I would have a max. For example, if in my last stages I had done this, then I would have a max. This is a big, big theorem. And it allows for many, many applications. When we get to optimization, we will use this theorem in the end. If you have suppose f of x is not a continuous function. Function on 
How many of you just seem intuitively obvious? Right? If I can connect this, then what happens is if this isn't a, a, a maximum or a minimum, but at some point I got to turn around, and where I turn around, I get a minimum, right? Then my lowest term. Seems obvious, right? This is actually a deep theorem and is beyond the scope of what we can do right here. It requires some subtle thought to the line, even though it's intuitively obvious. But we'll just face it. This allows us actually to all the time problems. Uh, for example, and we'll get to this later. Suppose I put a cone inside a sphere, right? So Notice I can make this cone all kinds of things. I can make it a tall, skinny cone, or I can make it a shorter, fat cone. But what value of, uh, well, what is the largest percentage of the volume of the sphere that this cone can take up? This is a problem we might want to know if we need the volume for something like this. This theorem says that we can find this answer. Because as you change the parameters of the cone, what you have is a continuous function on the flow of energy. You have to have a maximum and a minimum value. By the way, what's the three space of minimum value of volume of the cone inside there? Is? What happens if you make it taller and thinner like this? Volume being close to Zero, right? Because eventually you're going to have a stitch. It's going to be kind of full of pole. And if you go the other extreme, it will come down to a dot up here. So somewhere in the middle, there is probably a largest cone. And that's the same intelligence. But we'll get to these kinds of problems later. Okay. So this is a big theorem. Suppose that the basis continues on AB. Closed interval, then it contains its maximum minimum value. Uh, let me draw you one more picture of this because this is a force for meeting. Now, let's get ask ourselves. So, okay, this thing can attain its maximum minimum value. Where can this happen? Well, let me draw some this. Here's a continuous function. Where does it look like the minimum is? Minimum. Now, it looks like that you can have a minimum occurring at either end. 
Another good example of this is if you have this function here. Everybody agree the minimum occurs to the left and the maximum occurs to the right. So it looks like a lot of times minimum can occur at whatever the end. But sometimes, like here, you might have one of the extreme occur inside. Right? This certainly doesn't happen in the and you can put your eyeballs on it. Tell me what happens at that end. It looks to me like the way I've drawn this picture that the derivative, this is f of x, it looks like f prime of x is zero. I agree with you. Because what has to happen for you to have an interior max? You have to be at the top of the mountain. It looks like it's a little pendulum on zero. Or you need to be at the bottom of the valley, or like a, a, a U, right? So the end is zero. Unfortunately, slope of the pendulum didn't always have to be zero. There's a weird exception. Anybody know what that is? Right here, the maximum is here. It looks like slope is zero. No, it does. But what is true about that problem is here. You're right, you're mistaken, because it doesn't exist. Right. Y'all remember that, like maybe from 1040, where if things are too pointy or, or, or kind of cousin. But it's a cusp in this case, but it's pretty possible. But it looks like if you're at the top of the mountain, you're either going to be all smoothie, in which case the slope of the is zero, or you're going to or it's going to be prickly, and you're going to have a derivative value. And that is actually a big theorem do right now or bleed into it. Uh, I need a definition first. Uh, let f of x on a b just some interval here and and what I mean by this is C is a point that is interior, right? I don't want it to be an end uh, for reasons that I hope to explain here in a moment. We're coming to that. What I'm, what I'm going to do now is find what I call local max on a local man. Uh, yeah. F of C is uh, greater than or equal to F of X um, wrong X. Then F of C is a local level and if f of c is less than or equal to x, 
case, they then have to see if they both amend that. Okay, so let me give you cross seven four here. What it means to be a local extreme value is it is the top of a hump. That's what this means here. This means on some small interval surrounding C, F of C is the big kid on the block, right? F of C is bigger than F of X, all X, and whatever interval this is, right? It may not be the biggest kid around, but it's the biggest in the neighborhood. Tough guy in the neighborhood. So this right here. Local mass. Everybody agree? This was a big kid in the neighborhood, small neighborhood, right? But big one. This one is a local mass. Everybody agree? On a small literal interval, it's the big kid. And these are all local masses. Right? Top, top, top. Like this one. This one is certainly not bigger than any of these, right? Notice that this one is the absolute max, right? It's also the local max in this neighborhood. It just happens to be bigger than all the rest. This one's a local max, but it's not anywhere close to the max, right? This. Is a local max and so I think they got them all. Local mins are the places that hold water. Local men here, they're going here, right? Lewis kid in the neighborhood. Right there, right there, right there, right there. <laughs> now it looks like these endpoints here are local means too. But I only count the neighborhood if there's stuff on both sides of it. So I'm not going to count it. Because, uh, yes, this is smaller than everybody around it, but there's only stuff on one side. Everybody okay? So here's kind of a funny, this is kind of an interesting thing. This, this is one of the things that's different about one variable count. Does everybody feel like they understand what local man is? It's biggest or smallest in the neighborhood? Uh, notice this is the absolute max, and this is the, I guess this is probably the absolute man. Hard to tell. And they both turn out to be local men. You could have the absolute max at an endpoint, right? Which wouldn't be local. Let me ask you this. Between any two local maxes, what do you see here? There's a min between maxes. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you're going to be at the top of the mountain, and here's another top of the mountain, 
somewhere between you went below, there, there must be some land. There may be more mountains in this dream, but there's going to be at least one moon. Is this true in higher dimensions? <clears throat> How many of you, uh, how many of you watch the weather? Right, you ever seen what they do, like they put the map of the United States up? So they do the weather maps here. You ever seen the weather map look like this? Like a low pressure system, and then one next to it? This? And there's no high pressure system in between. Explain to me another example why that happens. So here's kind of a drawing of this. If you have two mountains, you don't have to have. A place to hold water between them. Notice at the top of the mountain, water all flows off. Do I agree with that? Does that mean that there has to be a place in between there that's a lake? Not necessarily. This could just be a ridge. This looks like one of those camelbacks, right? The one two months, right? So you can sit in there, right? This is like kind of like a crotch. Notice that this is a maximum and maximum, but there's no minimum in between them. Because at this point, it doesn't hold water, right? Water flows from the mountain down to this point, but then it flows off the other side because you've got that extra potential to, to work with. The maxes and ends kind of perform different in higher dimensions. You can have two lows or two highs next to each other without necessarily but in one dimension. If you have uh, two local maxes and it's continuous, you have to have one dimension. Kind of okay, any questions? Okay, so I'm going to give you a theorem here. Uh, theorem. Yeah, F as a local extreme. Oh, I just said extreme mode. That's a local extreme at C, F, C, and F prime of C exists. And F um, Actually, looking at this blue function picture myself, look at the local extrema here. At some point, of the, at some of these local extrema, like here, and here, and here, the derivative of this, some local extrema, they don't. But what is true? And all the local extremes where they exist. That probably is. This is our smooth top of the mountain. And actually, I think I can use this picture to help me show what this is. I'm going to call this C for illustration by showing you why this is true. This is just good exercise in old school. Everybody agree that's what that prophecy is. Okay. This is the limit as h goes to zero, right? So h is like 
H is like a little distance here, right? And H could be positive or negative, right? So let's suppose uh, C, F of C is a local maximum. Actually, it's a local minimum, but proof is almost exactly the same. And I'll let you fill in that detail. I'll only prove it from top of a mountain, and I'll let you figure out what it's like at the bottom of the valley. Okay, let's suppose this is a local max. Let's look at this limit. Now, f of c plus h and f of c, what's, uh, what's the relationship? Actually, let me just, let me not take the limit. Let me just, so consider this. Consider this thing I'm going to take the limit if H is positive, then and small, which is bigger, F of C plus H or F of C? Now remember, this is the local mass. Look at my picture here. F of C is the red top, right? Everybody agree? Black one on the top. F of C plus H, what happens? You come off the mountain. Do I agree with that? F of C is this, F of C plus H is a little smaller. So what do you say about this? Let's So, and H is positive, so uh, F of C plus H times F of C over H is less than or equal to zero. Because that's a negative divided by positive. It's still negative. So, F of C plus H minus F of C of A plus F of C. Now, on the other hand, if H is less than zero and abstract of H is small, So you're going the other side. Notice F of C plus H minus F of C is it's still negative, right? Because again, you're coming off the mountain. All right? So Y coordinate, small Y coordinate, so that's negative, right? But now H is less than zero. So F of C plus H minus F of C over H is greater than or equal to. Right, but now you've got a negative divided by a negative, so that's going to be a positive. So, so that's a conclusion. So the limit, say you go to zero. Positive side of F of C plus H minus F of C 
page. This project site is less than zero because you have a limit of numbers that are less than zero. That now, if you come to the other side, you have a limit of numbers that are positive. And these are both equal at a prime state. Because my assumption is the derivative exists. F prime C should be the right limit of the left. Limit. So now I've got this following statement here. I have F prime of C is greater than or equal to zero. And f prime of c is less than or equal to zero, and f prime of c exists. I only know one number that is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero. And what is that? So that's formally why if the derivative exists, it has to be zero. Okay, so let me let me uh, give you a couple of spinoffs of this, and then let's look at some examples. I'm going to show you how to use this. Corollary. C F C is uh, local extreme point. Then F prime C equal zero or non So, if, if you have an extreme point that is a local mass, local min, if you're at the top of the mountain, if you're at the bottom of the valley, then the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative doesn't exist. It's one of these two things. Let me point out that the other way is not true. Just because you have a place where the derivative is zero or doesn't exist does not necessarily mean that you have an extreme point. We'll make some examples of that. But this inspires the following definition, which we'll use quite a bit. Definition that f of x the function and c a number in the domain. Thanks. Uh, for my definition here, what I mean is f is just some function, and c is just some number that you can plug in there. It's, it's in the domain. If f prime of c equals zero, or f prime of c does not exist, then c is critical. So to be a critical number, it has to satisfy two criteria. Number one, it has to be in the domain of function. It has to be able to play in the function. And number two, the derivative of the function at that number has to either equal zero or does not exist. Okay. So let me give you uh, an example.
by the way, the domain is going to be this. What numbers? Let's find the third. And from the X, well, this is X to the minus one power. So minus X to the minus two. So this is So the critical numbers Where, where, where does the derivative equal zero? You know, that don't make sure to put it. It's equal to one. What's that? Uh, and notice that x equals zero the derivative that exists. Everybody agree with that? Is zero a critical number? Not in this case. Now, let me give you kind of a word of caution here. But let me give you. What's the domain of this? The domain of this function is everything. So I can plug in everything to x and I can take the cube root and it gets positive. G convex. One third x minus two thirds. Hmm. What do you pull next to the Notice this numerator is never zero. So that's one third. And that's essentially an even power because 
what do you how do you take a two third power of something you take the cube root of it first and then you square it and no matter what this thing right here is going to be zero so that numerator is always positive critical number is x because the derivative is going to find there Okay, let me point out that if you have a critical number, you may not have a local change. Here's an example here. Derivative of this is one third x to the power. Critical number and x equals zero. The derivative is undefined there. Uh, by the way, if you somebody describe why is the derivative undefined if it's a function x zero? What does it look like happens to the derivative there? Might look like it more if I draw that in better, but what does it look like the status of the tangent line is here? What does it look like the tangent line is right there? I'll give you a hint. That derivative doesn't exist. What does it feel like the tangent line is actually part of one? It's kind of a zero. Notice this function pass, this function is always in place. So there is no local stream, even though I got a curve. Uh, here's another one. And, and actually, it's very intimately related to this. This has a critical number of zero too. In fact, we can see the slope of the tangent line this time is the x-axis. But there's no local extreme because again, this function is always increasing. The moral story is this: just because you get a critical, that is, you get a point where the derivative is either zero or doesn't exist, it's not necessarily mean that you have a local extreme there, but it's a good but it must be the case in the policies. If you have a local extrema, you must have a critical number. Just because you have a critical number doesn't mean you have a local extrema. Local extrema is a strong term. So local extrema is like a local extrema is like having a Lexus. And a critical number is like having a car, right? If you have a car, do you necessarily have a Lexus? No, I mean, go look at my car. It's McDonald's, don't you? Leave me, right? But if you have a Lexus, you basically have a, you have a car, right? So having a local extreme is a strong one. But the critical numbers are a great way to search for local extreme. So let me give you kind of a practical thing here. Um, So let me give you kind of some instructions here. In fact, maybe we want to help me figure this out. How we find uh, max min values of a continuous function.
So you all are engineers mostly. Let's see if we can put together a practical way to figure out how to algorithmically find maximum value for community functional filtering. How do we use this picture to kind of help us out? Where's the minute for this particular at the loop like the left end? Uh where's max code? At a low command, it's high. I agree with that. So Given my picture, let's think what will happen. If you have a function f of x, where are the possibilities that a maximum end would be? Right, but I mean, there are actually infinitely many points between x by between here and here. But I point out that for this particular function, one, two, six, there's only nine places where the maximum end could be. Nine is right there. What are my usual suspects? What are my usual suspects? Okay, or more generally, maybe the slope is not defined, right? So, what has to happen for these functions? The, where the maximum has to occur is either at the ends, right? And we saw that happen here. It's either got to occur at one of the two endpoints, or it has to occur at the top of a mountain or a bottom of a valley inside. And if you're at the top of a mountain or a bottom of a valley inside, what are you going to get? Well, the way I've drawn it, the slopes of the change is always zero, but it could have it could have been something like this. It could have been spiked here. It has to occur at a critical moment. So this gives us a fantastic way to, in a short spell, figure out the maximum ends of the previous function of flow theorem. Number one, f prime of x. Two, determine critical number. F prime of C equal to zero or F prime of C does not exist. Do not forget about the do not, does not exist. In fact, in high school courses, I think often I tend to skip over this a little bit. So take the derivative. Okay, that's old school for us. Gather up all the critical numbers. So now we've got our usual sus suspects. So for this picture, uh, we've gathered up the critical numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven critical numbers. We've got two of them. So let's make some more of that. And the endpoints. Plug these in to the function, not the derivative. I already know that when I plug in the ones in the middle of the endpoint, when I, when I plug in the critical numbers of the derivative, I'll be mean, zero doesn't exist. Plug these into the function. Plug these into the function. Biggest is the max. Smallest is the minimum. Simple as that. This is a wonderful, wonderful algorithm because, you know, if I just walk up to you on the street, in fact, I am I'm going to walk right up to you on the street right now and do this. Let's take f of x is minus
Uh, no, all the funds. Yeah. How many of you know before today? How many of you have any inkling? Okay, how big can this be and how small? This seems like kind of a daunting problem, doesn't it? But the fact of the matter is, it's, 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 you know, if you know this theorem about the things from alternatives. So let's let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. Let's go through this process. Um, f of x is x to the four thirds plus four x to the one third. And you know what? I'm going to do this. This is again, I, I told you earlier in the course, don't simplify anything unless there's something in it for you. There is something in it for me a little bit here. All I, I, all I did is I sucked an extra one third out, multiply this back and check me. Uh, one third and one is four thirds. Ding, ding, ding. Got that right. Four x and one third. Yeah. The reason I did this is because it's easier to plug in values for this because I'm not going to use the calculator. By the way, you can take the derivative. I'm going to need the derivative. That's the part of my recipe. You can take the derivative of either one of these because it's the same. I recommend this. So f prime of x is four thirds x to the one third plus four thirds x to the minus two thirds. Straight up. And again, I'm going to rewrite this because this is really going to help you pick up my critical numbers. Here are the algebra is. And help me. I'm going to suck a four thirds x to the minus two thirds out of that. That's going to be going to pull four thirds out of this. One third minus minus two thirds is x. And you can multiply back to see that I'm right. Four thirds x to the minus two thirds. And that's x to the three thirds is four thirds x to one third. And then that's just ones. This algebraic simplification makes it much easier for me to pick out critical numbers. X equals what? One. And in fact, maybe might be better. So this, how do you make the numerator here? X equals one. Numerator, right? Negative one. How do you make the denominators here? There's your two correct numbers. Okay with me? What are my other suspects? The endpoints, right? It says are minus two and three. And now, just the uh, Just let the inquisition take care of everything else. F of minus one. What happens when I put in minus one here? Remember, put this into the function, and I'm going to use this piece because it's easy. When I put in minus one to this, I get minus one. Two root of minus one is minus one. Put in minus one here, I get three. So that's minus. Three. Zero is zero. That was easy. Right. 
about f of minus two. So when I put in minus two here, I'm going to get minus two root of two times two. Two on the third times negative, and that's four minus two. I'm going to do two times, or if you like, if you're so inclined, it's negative two to four thirds. Whatever you want. And f of three is. That's the cube root of three times seven. Okay. There are the values of function. All we've got to do is figure out who's going to. Uh, let me ask the easy one first. What's the maximum? Which one? Six. That is correct. What's the easiest way to tell us the maximum? It's the only one that's positive, right? The rest of them are zero or negative. Now, would everybody agree that either negative three or this number is um, one of these two is negative? I guess we look out there. Somebody tell me. Uh, which one of these is actually smaller? What's that? Right, but then you got to take the cube root of that. Okay. So think about it this way. So this is what it boils down to. Which one of these two numbers is big, right? Think about it this way. What happens when you cube this one? What do you get? And the reason I say cube it is because I want to get rid of that stupid. If I cube this, what do I get? Two to the fourth, right? Which is what? Six. Seven. Yeah, two to the fourth time. If I cube this, this would be two to the fourth. Which is six, three. What happens if I cube three? What do I get? 27. This one is actually bigger. So this is sort of a, a more dramatic negative, right? So that's nice. Any questions? Okay, let's do another one of that ilk. Um, this one's kind of a fun one. And again, with these problems, <laughs> okay, any questions on this? Is this algorithm clear to you all? So I'm going to ask you one like this. Let's do another one. How about All right, I want to double guess the maximum absolute minimum. Uh, and where they are. Okay. The calculus again for this one is pretty easy. Uh, the hard part is kind of sort of we're figuring out where the critical numbers are so good. So we have f of x equals uh, okay, you guys got to help me out here. My derivatives and whatnot. Okay. 
What's the derivative of uh, two sine x? I could. Uh, better. Uh, what's the derivative of cosine of y? Negative sine of y. Am I done? Or what's inside in this case? Right. So there's my good old derivative. Now I've got to find places where the derivative is either zero or does not exist. No place will this does not exist, right? Because both of these functions are continuous everywhere. There's, there's no problem here. So I'm only looking for places where the derivative is zero. Uh, but this sucks. Uh, what's the derivative of cosine of You know, one of the things that's really, what's one of the things about this is totally kind of different. That's right. I've got, I've got cosine x on the other side of this. On the other end of it, sine of 2x. You might think it's way different. Situation, how about I trade? I think you might remember the sign of two actually. How many of you remember that there is such an animal out there that you don't remember exactly what it is? Right, that's the important. I will give it. This is free. I will give it. the only the only trick I did is you should really remember the sign of where they supposed to be. But you need to remember how to use this. That's the old double angle thing, right? So let's see what we got here. Oh, that helps because now what, I, what can I do? I can jerk out that cosine. It's got a common factor of cosine. So after all this, get two cosine x times one minus two sine x. And now that's so much more doable. And still, I do have. Do have another problem. So I want to start pulling that critical, right? And those are, those, those are places where these are zero or undefined. Neither one of these is ever undefined. So either that's going to be zero or that's going to be zero, right? So let's find places where it's not interesting. And first thing that bothers me is this how many places is the cosine equal to zero? That happens infinitely often. I have not been really making things explicit. But I don't have to. That is correct. The important thing is these functions can have critical numbers all over the place. You only care about the ones that are in this range, right? I can't even remember this very well. So let me draw a circle here. Minus i. Uh, um, how many places is the cosine that's x squared at zero? Okay, right there and right there. So it looks like x equals uh, minus pi two and pi over. Those are the only places between zero and pi. I'm sorry, between negative pi and pi. Where? Everybody okay with that? Okay, maybe you guys can tell me what the other one The other one is so the other question. Uh, this or sine x is one half. Where does that happen? 
sort of insults me. I'm fine, fine. And I want the sign X to be one half. Now, on the circle, I think that the sign is black So, it looks like at this angle and at this angle. How six? How is it Good. Because it should be this angle taken away from high, right? So it should be six power six minus power six. And the endpoints. So I've got six suspects here. Let's go through it. So uh, these ones in the interrogation room here. Yeah. Uh, minus power two. Yeah. Uh, no. F of I over six, F of five pi over six, F minus pi, M. And let me recall for you, F of X was, was it was two sine X was cosine two X. I'm going to get warmed up with the pile of the twos and such. I'm going to do that pile first. Let's see what we have. Sine of pi is zero. And cosine of two pi is one. Okay. How about negative pi? Sine of negative pi is zero. Cosine of minus two pi is also one. By the way, the value of the function is the same on the endpoints. It's not surprising me because the function repeats every two pi. So I'm not too surprised that negative pi then two pi later of pi, you get the same. So that's that's kind of good gut check. How about pi over two? Sine of pi over two is one, so it's two times one is two. And this will be cosine of pi, which is negative one. So I get one here. I'm getting a lot of ones. Let's try f of minus power two. Sine of minus power two, what's that? And I need cosine of minus pi is minus one. Here I get minus three. That was to the power of six business. The sine of power of six is one half, as it should be, so it's two times one half. And this will be cosine of power of three which is also a half so that's one and a half is three halves five power six sine five, five power six should also be one and a half in fact that's where they can sine is one and a half there plus cosine of five pi over three so Five power of three, six power of three, power of three. So that's also half. So the minimum, so the conclusion is. 
negative three. And it occurs at minus power of six. It occurs once in that range. The maximum, what's the maximum? Looks like it's uh, three halves, right? And it occurs twice. It occurs at power six and five power six. Yes. We got what? Right here. Oh, you, you don't understand where the where the actual ones came from? They were given in the problem. It's just part of the problem. Right? Just find how big this is on the Okay. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to do one more theorem for you. Um, well, everybody got what they need to. So, this will give, give us a head start in tomorrow. Rolls theorem. Intermediate time. Okay. Okay. How many of you have ever heard of roles? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna show it to you here. Suppose f of x is a function uh, on the interval both in such that one f of x is continuous on a three. So I can draw the same both interval subject with my pencil. F x is differentiable So everywhere inside of it, I can take the derivative. And three. The y coordinate at both ends is the same. And there is a C and M plane B with here. Oh, yeah. So here's what Rolls theorem says. Suppose I have a function of both in plane B. And the y coordinates at the end are the same. And I've got to draw this continuously, and I can't make any cusp or anything. And it's derivative. It's always derivative. Then there's some place inside here where the derivative. In fact, the way that I drew it. How many places do you see those variables? I mean, it looks like there's five. First one, first value, second one, second value, third.
Now, I want to give you another theory. I'm going to show you why this is both true. Okay. Now, this is is a function on a b such that one f of x is continuous on a b and two f of x is differential I'm not going to assume that the whiteboard is the end of the same. So let me draw this function. Let me draw, let me do another illustration. We'll go to Rolls theorem tells you that one point in between here where the circle of the is zero. In the previous example, I gave there were several. Right? Did you agree that you said you point one here? Now, I find the assumption that two points of the same whiteboard is somewhat artificial, right? Continuous and differentiable, that's a natural assumption. Now, imagine that this is uh, this is a handle, and I get this out and I'm twisted up. Now, look at this point here. Is the slope of this now zero? No, it's not zero. It's, but what it is, is it's parallel to what? It's parallel to that role of the line created by the end. So, the conclusion of the mean value here is this. Then, there, then there is a C, a B, where F prime C. So this theorem is basically Rolle's theorem, but almost literally a twist. That's what we did. We twisted this up. Notice this point is say B F B, and this is A F A. That's what these optical bit. It's the same principle. And notice what Rolle's theorem says is. Slope of this here is this. So, what this both uh, what the mean value theorem says is the slope of this tangent line here is parallel to the dotted line that connects the endpoints. The proof of Rolle's theorem is easy. And once you know that, and you know this twist, then this might think about why it's true and why we might care because we're going to get some applications. Okay, any questions? Any questions? All right. So, in this quiz now. 